Hey, how you doing? This is RJ. So today I'm going to piggyback a little bit off of my last Saturday's video, although you don't need to go and watch last Saturday's video in order to understand what I have to say today. But I want to tackle the question of when do you trust creators again? Because my last Saturday's video was about the fact that Hollywood and other smaller forms of entertainment are failing because they no longer have the trust of their audience. In that video, more or less, I was answering some objections that Richard Meyer over at Comics Matter has about Hollywood and the people that he calls anti-SJWs. He's saying that those people, anti-SJWs, are just as bad as SJWs, just in the opposite direction. And they no longer trust anything coming out of Hollywood, they will just automatically ridicule it. And it is his position that you need to trust them if they put out something of merit. You can't just have a knee-jerk reaction of what he calls anti-SJWs, because once again, he would call that ideological thinking. But here's the point, the point that I'm going to discuss within this video. First of all, if you have an SJW and an anti-SJW, and they're both ideologues, are they equal? I would say no. Why? Because intent and context matter. And two, to answer the first question I asked, when will you trust these people again? Is it just ideological to say never? Or to say maybe decades from now? And my answer to that again is no. And no, because once again, intent and context matter. And that's what I'm going to do, more or less, go over the intent and the context of why these things are. Because once again, heaven help us all, because I, for some reason, have become, in this small corner of the internet, the person who looks at the actual arguments, examines the actual arguments, and gives the rational take on things. But before we get there, just a quick reminder that there are two links in the description and the pinned comment for my three graphic novels, two superhero graphic novels, and one return to form for low fantasy, sword and sorcery, and you're looking at some of the beautiful art from those graphic novels in the background. These are stories which concentrate on true heroism, heroes as paragons of virtue, at the very least, heroes or people trying to become those heroes. That's what my stories are centered around. I center them also around the traditional way, the merit-based way of creating not only the story for myself, but for my audience and what they want. And if any of that sounds or looks appealing to you at all, click on one of those links in the description or the pinned comment and go on over and see if one of my graphic novels is for you. And a little bit of housekeeping here, which is actually a really good transition into my main topic, but I've gotten a number of people contacting me saying that they were forcibly unsubscribed from my channel. So I would ask you just for a moment to have your eyes flutter down to the subscription tab to see if you are still subscribed. And if you're not, please hit the subscription button. It does help immensely to have people subscribe to my channel. And to get into our topic, I want to jump off right there and say, yes, your subscription to my channel does matter. Why? Because there are forces at play that don't actually want my channel to succeed. And I know that for a fact, and I'll get into that just for a moment. Small though it may be, they do exist. It's funny, during the week I ran across a video and it was this person with about 1.3 million subscribers talking about what you need to do in order to be successful on YouTube. So I thought, okay, I'll give it a listen. And when I did give it a listen, the main core of the message was work with the algorithm. And such a message for me just doesn't work. Why? Because I know that my channel works against the algorithm. If I want to actually be truthful and say what I want to say, it does. It works against the algorithm. Now, again, how do I know this? Well, I know this because I can see all of those comments you people try to post on my videos, but get flagged. They go into a held section of my comments and only I can see them. And I know exactly why YouTube, whether it be actual people or just a computer program, is deleting some of your comments. Some of it is because you use naughty words. Some of it is because you express things in language which they consider to be hateful. So it's basically hate speech laws for their platform. So it's not a free speech platform, obviously. And thirdly is because sometimes you use non-politically correct language, pure and simple. And I'm against politically correct language, pure and simple. I'm for true heroism, which is a part of the human nature and expressed by reality. Politically correct is a term that was generated out of the USSR and their attempt to control 
the speech of people and their actions, which does include hampering their ability to discuss what is true. And I freely admit, in order for me to make some of these videos, I have to use language which is not straightforward. I have to use terms which don't actually describe the exact thing that I'm trying to talk about. Why? Because then no one would see my videos. And I'm going to do a little bit of that here today. I pretty much do it almost every video. And one of the funny things about this entire media complex within which we are operating right now is the fact that if you look at the ideologues or we'll just say the quote unquote progressive people on the other side, they purposefully misspell things on social media. Why? Because they don't want the other side to see what they're saying. They only want their audience to see what they're saying. Whereas on my side of the fence, the side that Zach would call anti-SJW, we have to purposefully misspell things so the audience can actually see what we say. And my point with that is the fact that, you see, intent and context definitely matter when you're discussing these true groups of people. You can't automatically assume all things being equal besides what you're talking about because all things are not equal. We get treated much differently even from the social media platforms that we're on. So let's then tackle this first question right away when considering all that I have just said. Are anti-SJWs, if they are ideologues, just the same as SJWs, except that they have a different political perspective? No, no, they're not. And that's easily provable when you understand the stance that all things are not equal behind looking at the fact that one is promoting SJW content and one is promoting anti-SJW content. And I'm talking about whether or not each side is ideological or not. I could easily just say, well, no, because we on this side consider our arguments and therefore it's not ideology. But let's just for a moment assume that the people on this anti-SJW side are indeed ideologues as well. Does that make them equal to SJWs, to your quote-unquote progressive crowd? No, it doesn't. Why? Because intent and context matter. It was just as I was talking about in my last video about the difference between propaganda that is meant to deceive and propaganda, the old style, like hundreds of years ago, propaganda used to propagate an idea because some people simply needed to be treated in a non-rational way because they didn't think rationally. What's the difference between the two? Well, the difference is presenting an idea in the old way to propagate an idea in a non-rational way, but doesn't prohibit people from actually exploring the rational way in order for them to understand it better. That's actually one of the things that you would want them to do when you propagate an idea in such a way. Yes, you're teaching it to them in a non-rational way, but you would say, but if they can actually understand it rationally, then they should step up and be allowed to understand it rationally. That would be much better. But the modern propaganda way is to teach things in a non-rational way, in a way that gets around your rational mind so that you can never truly engage your rational mind to think about the problem. And they do that in a way to say that this is the only way that you can think about what is being said right here. At its heart, it's an appeal to authority. It's saying this is an authoritative statement and you can't go behind it. Whereas the old way of propagating an idea through such means would be to say, yes, we're using authority and appeal to authority in order to teach you this. But if you want to see why that authority is actually real, why it's based on reality, come and speak to us rationally. And so it is the difference between SJWs and anti-SJWs, even if both sides are simply ideologues. For your SJW crowd, your quote-unquote progressives, they promote ideas based upon ideology, but those ideas are based upon ideology in order to ensure that you can never look deeper at those ideas because if you did, if you applied logic and reason to them, if you compared them to reality, which is what I do on my channel and have from the first, you'll see that they fall apart extremely easily to the point where you can see that they're simply not real. What they're telling you is a lie. 
They're simply telling you the lie over and over again, making sure that you have no outside sources to compare the lie to because you have to believe only the lie. Whereas if you have an anti-SJW who is indeed an ideologue and doesn't understand the deeper rational meaning behind what they're saying, it doesn't matter because there is a deeper rational meaning behind what they're saying. There's a reason, and I'll go over some of those reasons in a few minutes, but if you take their ideology, and again, you apply logic and reason to it, if you compare it with reality, you will see, yeah, that has some rational, logical backing. That has the backing of reality itself. And again, this is why I concentrate so much on the idea of hero. Because it's something, as far as I'm concerned, and Western civilization, and I would say even most of the world, would consider part of human nature, part of what it is to be a human being. And one of the great things about heroism, if it is indeed that, is that you don't need to have all of those intellectual arguments. You don't have to understand the complexity of every last one of them in order to understand what is going on with the idea of heroism. You can simply live it out and reality will show you the results and how it is real. And that's really where the rubber hits the road. If you have these ideologues, these quote-unquote progressive ideologues, SJWs, and you live out to the T their ideology, it will lead to destruction, death, and chaos. Reality proves that. But if you take the anti-SJW stance and you live out that ideology, knowing nothing more than the ideology, reality will bear it out and show you, yes, it leads to creativity. It leads to genuine connection. It leads to life and creation. So, to break the entire thing down to one principled argument, that is to say, to go back to the principle, the problem with Richard and his idea of looking at both sides as if everything was equal, not looking at the intent, not looking at the context, is an idea which, really, I think, thinkers like Richard are basically stuck in the 1990s mindset, but it's an idea of relativism. It's the idea that all ideas are relative. Therefore, you can put them on equal footing when you discuss them, when you examine them. But no, no, no. Reality actually has a stake in the game here. Not all things are relative. And once you recognize that point, that not everything is relative, and you add the context, you can then, once again, look at the intent of the people and see that, no, these two sides are not equal. Now, right here, I want to break off and go on a little sidetrack just for a minute, talking about the fact that this point is going to be nailed home, I think, within, well, the near future. I would say probably within the next five years. Because here's the problem. And I thought this from the very first of watching Zach's channel over at Comics Matter back when it was diversity in comics. You see, he doesn't actually trust what the other side says. I actually do trust a lot of what the other side says. I think they are being honest about a lot of things. Now, you have to look at their intent and why they're saying it, and you'll see that why they say they're saying it and why they're actually saying it are two completely different things. But one of the things that I believe when they actually say it is when they talk about how and again, I have to use colorful language because of where we are. So your quote-unquote progressive side claims over and over again that messages like mine are so harmful that they're actually ending the existence of people on the other side. Now, people like Zach and, again, a lot of people who have a relativistic mindset would just look at that and say that's a nonsense statement. But again, if you look at the context and their intent behind what they're saying, I actually think what they're saying is true. Because what they're basically saying is that if you promote the idea that they are not worthy of praise in every way, shape, or form, eventually they're going to be forced into a corner wherein many of them will end their own existence on this mortal coil. That's the harm that they're talking about. And I'm looking at the whole thing going, yeah, that's what's going to happen. Why? Because you people on this side have mental problems. Those mental problems you are treating with the placebo of acceptance. And if we take that acceptance away from you and you have nowhere else to turn, yeah, a lot of you are going to turn to that direction. 
This is what I can see easily happening within the next five years. And if you keep up with the mindset of people like Zach, you're going to say to yourself, just as he looked at the situation of Ed Piscor, Ed Piscor being basically on the other side, being a comic pro who did indeed do this exact thing to himself. He no longer exists in this world. And he left a note saying, these people within the comic industry are my murderers. I'm looking into the future going, I understand, Zach, what you're saying about this being a horrible thing, but you do realize that in the near future, someone on the other side is going to do the exact same thing to themselves and leave a note saying, you're the cause of why they are doing it to them. And if you believe this relativistic idea of all ideas are equal, you're going to come to a crisis point within your own thinking and whether or not you actually have a channel. Because the whole thing revolves around the context of the fact that they're trying to live a life which is destructive and going to cause harm to other people. And those other people, in part, are themselves. That's what reality bears out. And that's what's going to happen. And if you start blaming yourself for pointing out that reality and have it actually come to pass because you have a relativistic way of thinking, then you might as well just quit now because it's gonna happen. But let's get back on track here. So I answered the question, are both sides equal? even if they're ideologues, SJWs and anti-SJWs? And the answer is no. If you look at it rationally and logically, the answer is no, because you have to look at context and the intent of the people. Now, let's bring this idea of intent even further and then discuss the question of when you can actually trust these people again and if it makes any sense whatsoever to trust them. Even if they're going to start to put out products that appear to be merit-based, do you trust them? And the answer is no, because context and intent matter. And I want to look at the bigger context and we'll zoom in little by little for the next minute or two. These people, these quote-unquote progressive people, part of their ideology is the idea of the long march through the institutions. Now, I could go back to Gramsci in the 1930s and bring it forward, but let's just go back to the 1960s when this phrase was coined. And I'll just read you a little excerpt from Wikipedia about the fellow and the people around him who originally came up with and promoted this idea to see how exactly this is connected deeply to the idea of media and the promotion of stories, whether they be, again, within news or fiction stories or all the things that we're discussing right now, comics, television, movies, etc. And once again, I go directly to Wikipedia. Why? Because it is definitely a left-leaning source of information. So it is leaning towards their own way of interpreting things. I'm not trying to put words in their mouth. It begins by saying, the long march through the institutions is a slogan coined by socialist student activist Rudi Deutschke, it's a German name, perhaps I got it right, probably not, around 1967 to describe his strategy to create radical change in government by becoming part of it. The phrase long march is a reference to the physical long march of the Chinese Communist Army. And they do go into a little bit of a tie with Gramsci in the 1930s, but I won't go into that. They also talk about, and I quote, a Marxist philosopher who says this is essential for the achievement of utopia. Now, I just wanted to stick that in there because every time I say these quote-unquote progressive people want to build a utopia, I get a progressive person in the comments saying, we don't want to build a utopia. Well, no, yeah, if you look at the actual underpinnings of your ideology, that's what they're trying to do, build a utopia. It says that right here in black and white. But I want to read to you just a short quote from one of these philosophers, these Marxist philosophers, Herbert Mercuse, which I've actually mentioned a couple of times on my channel before. And he's talking about this idea of the long march through the institutions just when they came up with that slogan. He says, To extend the base of the student movement, Rudy Dushki has proposed the strategy of the long march through the institutions. That is, working against the established institutions while working within them, but not simply by boring from within, rather by doing the job, learning how to program and read computers, how to teach all levels of education, how to use the mass media, how to organize production, how to recognize and askew planned obsolescence, how to design, etc. And at the same time, 
preserving one's own consciousness in working with others. The Long March includes the concerted effort to build up counter-institutions. And he goes on to say, this is especially important for the development of radical free media. The fact that the radical left has no equal access to the great chains of information and indoctrination is largely responsible for their isolation. So, long story short, you want to get people into the institutions, one of those institutions being media, one of those core institutions that he talks about being media, because they see media simply as an indoctrination tool, and the reason why their ideas are not catching on is because they're not in control of this, as they call it, indoctrination tool. So, therefore, you put people in the positions to actually learn how to do all of these things that these media platforms, these media companies, these media institutions actually do, learn how to do it, and then take it over from within, always remembering why you're there to subvert the entire thing and to build it into an institution which counters the original purpose for it by taking their, quote-unquote, progressive, utopian, Marxist message and make it the core of what they're doing within the media institution itself. This is one of the principles of your quote-unquote progressive ideology, a long march through the institutions. Now, let's zoom in just a little bit from that overview from the 1960s. One of the sources that I commonly go back to is a book published in the, I think it's mid-1990s it actually came out. It's called After the Ball. And someone pointed out to me that you can get this online. It's very difficult to have an actual physical copy of it because they try to memory hole it. But yeah, it is online. You can get a PDF of it online if you want to go read the entire thing and see exactly what I'm talking about. But what it is, is a book based upon two guys who are of the quote unquote alphabet community, again, language. And they're saying, if America is ever going to accept the alphabet community, they need to do it not through truth, but through media spin. That's what they do. These two people that wrote the book, they're basically media analysts and people who spin media. So they're saying, yeah, we got to look at this entire thing as a way to sell this idea to the American public. And they go on to describe how, again, use relativistic terms so that people ignore the actual reality. You boil their arguments down to straw men. You say, cut that off from the actual evidence that proves their points, and you use the media spin to promote this idea. And that's the playbook that people have been playing off of since, at the very least, the mid-1990s, because this book was written and distributed a little bit, I think, in the mid to late 1980s, but didn't get a full publication until the mid-1990s, or about 1993, if my memory is correct. But again, the point is that this became the modern playbook of how to deal with things, especially within media, because that's their background, talking about media, and how to promote these ideas within American society. And why do I concentrate so much on this? Well, because look at Zach's entire channel. He's saying, what the problem with comics is right now is that it is focusing on such a niche audience, this possibly 3% of the population. Obviously, that's the only people that it appeals to, and you're going to make your entire industry fail if that's your customer base. But that is their customer base, and he is correct on that. Why? Because they followed this playbook from the early to mid-1990s to the T. It became a media spin campaign rather than looking at truth. They said, no, no, don't look at the truth. There's a little sleight of hand going on here. They freely admit that within the book. They're playing sleight of hand. And I could go on about this entire thing, but again, I'll stop there and just say, this is the media playbook that they have been using. Don't believe me? Let's look at something even closer. Let's zoom in once again. Last year, last year, I covered a presentation by the Writers Guild of America. It's still up on YouTube. I'll put the link for it in the description. It's two and a half hours long, if I remember correctly. So if you want to go watch it, you're going to have to have a lot of patience. But it's talking about the media platforms that Zach and I and people in this corner of the internet usually talk about. They're talking about comic books. They're talking about television. They're talking about movies. The actual title for the video is Queer Eye for Comic Books, LGBTQ Plus Voices 
on IP adaptations for film and television. And it has a number of people. I think there are nine people on this panel. Many of them work within both the comic industry and the television and or movie industry. One of those people would be one of the people that Zach routinely talks about over and over again, the creator of Kim and Kim, and I don't know his name off the top of my head, nor do I much care, so I'll just leave it at that. But it's someone who Zach regularly talks about. And at one point within this discussion, when that creator that Zach routinely talks about finishes saying what they're saying, another person pipes up and says they are exactly right. And he goes on to say the following. By the way, this is at about timestamp 43. And the guy speaking also works in comics, but I think they said he has something like 16 to 18 television and film products on the go as well. So yeah, someone who has his hand in both industries, he says, and he's talking about a film festival that I've never really heard of, nor could find much information on, just because he's so vague. But he says, like, on the alpha side, as the largest LGBTQIA film festival, one of the programmers the other day, and again, this is 2023, but he says, the other day was talking to us about the cycle of trans and queer narratives and how first they need to be tragic. So again, we can have empathy with the larger public. And you know, we have our HIV stories and all these things that have already happened. And then they turn into comedy and sort of that best friend character or what have you, and their supporting characters, and the main character, and then we go into the normalization. So, a little bit of context here, of course. What they're talking about slightly before this is how they want to, in the future, move these kinds of stories into the normalization sphere. That's where they believe they are at this point, 2023, that they no longer have to have this empathy style of story where people identify with them because that's in the past or have people identify with them as the comedy or the best friend of the main character no no they need to be the main character now that's what more and more is happening they're talking about how that's the future of stories in general because they say that the next generation is in their estimation 15 percent part of the rainbow community so it's growing by leaps and bounds and that's the future but really, the entire point is, again, he's talking about a major film festival wherein they had a presenter come on and lay out the history of how they actually got to this point of normalization. He gives that history as first presenting their stories as tragic, then as comedic, then as the best friend, and then as part of normalization. And he's talking about it in historical terms. That is to say, what they've done over the last number of years. Now, let's look at exactly how many years that took. And again, the reason why I'm going over this is because this is an example of the long march through the institutions and an application of the playbook from after the ball. It is subvert what you have in front of you, present what we want you to present, even if it's a lie, because we're slowly going to grow this idea and take over the entire industry, which is exactly what the long march through the institutions is. And again, someone might say, well, that's just an assumption on your part. You can't actually make that claim. Well, yeah, I can. Why? Because I've been around this corner of the internet for quite a while. Let's look back just for one second to another thing that I covered from 2017. Once again, by the way, the origins of it connected to one of the people which Zach talks about a lot on his channel, which is Heidi McDonald. She took part in a round of panels which discusses inserting, once again, these rainbow-colored ideas into the gaming community. And back in 2017, as part of Queer Gaming Con, introduced a panel which was literally titled Trojan Horse Narratives, Sneaking in Queer Stories. And again, I could put a link for that in the description as well, because it's still on YouTube. So yeah, these people know exactly what they're doing. Again, this is the long march through the institutions. They are purposely sneaking in as Trojan horses their stories and have been for quite some time. Oh, by the way, that Trojan horse story panel talks about the previous step within what they talk about here in the Writers Guild of America presentation. They're talking about the pre-normalization period, which is 
the identification period, getting the audience to identify with these characters. But here's the point. Let's look at that entire thing they talked about, this process that they talked about, as I gave you the quote from the Writers Guild of America, of introducing these ideas slowly into your narrative until it becomes normal. And let's go back to when these things were first being presented in the original presentation that he talks about, which is the empathetic stories, which were the presentation of these HIV stories. When did that actually take place? Well, let's look at when it took place within comics. When did it take place within comics? That would be the mid-90s. Again, I covered a interview with Bobby Chase, one of the editors-in-chiefs at Marvel Comics from the mid-1990s. She was talking to another representative at Marvel Comics, and she was saying, oh, by the way, guess what? When she got to Marvel, she was just looking for a job, and they interviewed her and said, okay, we'll give you the job. But, by the way, and this is words out of her own mouth, she was told, check your politics at the door because the Midwestern sensibilities of our audience do not mix with your northern east coast politics so check them at the door and she literally says yes she nodded her head and then went about doing the exact opposite why she goes on to say that this is what her parents taught her to do her parents whenever they would move to a different place they were heavy quote-unquote progressive people they would join the republican party in that place why so as progressives they could gum up the works of everything the party was doing within their area to subvert it to work at it from the inside to counter everything that they're trying to do so that they become non-productive and again, she says this is exactly what she did when she got into Marvel Comics. And she was the one who published, as they talk about in that interview, the seminal story about this HIV crisis and making these kinds of people relatable. And guess what? What does she say? She says also that, yes, it's an iconic story that was groundbreaking at the time, but she did it in a way where she was subverting everything around her. She knew, and she admits, that if she had gone to editorial with this story and said, can I publish this, which is what she's supposed to do, because she wasn't the editor-in-chief at that point, they would have told her no. So she purposely did not go to them and published it anyways without their knowledge because she figured she'll just ask for forgiveness because if she asked for permission, they would have told her no. Again, let's look at the time frame of that, early to mid-1990s. And again, look at the words from the woman herself saying, yeah, she worked from the inside to subvert this institution, lying about what she intended to do. Now let's jump over to the movie industry for a second and look at an equivalent to this issue of, I think it was the Incredible Hulk where they published that story. Anyways, if you look at the movie equivalent of this groundbreaking story where you present a HIV story in order to make these people relatable, in order to begin this process of normalization, when did that occur? Well, the groundbreaking story for that was the film Philadelphia back in 1993. So what's my point with this entire thing? Well, my point with this entire thing is that, yes, the long march through the institutions, as Bobby Chase clearly shows, is something that is definitely practiced and has been practiced for decades and decades within media institutions. Which means what? Which means that these people have been slowly trying to sell you these stories in order to bring about a normalization of these ideas through falsehoods for the minimum of the last three decades. So if someone has been lying to you for three decades and all of a sudden says, oh no, I turned over a new leaf. Here's one little thing that I did that actually shows that I'm on your side now. Are you going to believe them? Are you going to trust them? No. The logical, rational, reality-based reaction to that is to say, no, I'm not trusting you. It's not just a knee-jerk reaction. Maybe it's been taught through an ideological anti-SJW way of a knee-jerk reaction, but it's based upon what is real. Richard references this schoolyard behavior that he experienced as a child, trying to go back to that over and over again, saying, yeah, you got in a fight with some guy, and then all of a sudden, later that afternoon or the next day, you just forgot about it. You didn't hold on to a grudge. And he's saying, and referencing that to try to sell people the idea that, yeah, we have to forgive these people. But at the same time, he's also saying these people, 
and how they operate are worse than the Taliban. He says, as a soldier, he actually met members of the Taliban, and these people within your quote-unquote progressive entertainment system are worse than that. I'm sorry, but you can't take those two ideas and lay them down next to each other and have them make sense. These people are not schoolyard bullies. They are the equivalent of guerrilla insurgents. If you had one of the local population keep on coming into your forward operating base and planting IEDs so as to destroy you, when you catch him, do you say, oh, well, you told us you're never going to do it again. Go on your way. No, you don't do that. And especially if they do it over and over and over and over again. If they bring you a present every time they're going to plant explosives in your camp, do you just say, oh, well, you did something good for once. Let's just be friends now. No, no, you don't. And again, I always have to stick this in here because someone in the comments inevitably will say, well, you're a Christian. Aren't you supposed to forgive and forgive and forgive? Doesn't it say, how many times do I forgive? Seven times, which is supposed to be the perfect number. And it goes on to say, no, not seven times, but seven times, seven times or 77 times, depending on your translation. Isn't that what it says? Forgive over and over again? And then they bring up the idea of forgive and forget. No, I'm sorry. Forgive and forget, by the way, is from Shakespeare, not from the Bible. And sure, that is in there, but there's also a point in there where they say, well, if someone is teaching some things that are wrong, what do you do with that person? Well, you go to them personally and say, you're teaching something wrong. Stop it. And if they don't, you take more people with you and you say, you're teaching something wrong, stop it. And if they don't believe you and they keep on going, you take someone authoritative with you and you say, you're teaching something wrong, stop it. And if they don't, after that third time, do that, then they become anathema to you. What does that mean? They become a curse to you. And again, what does that mean? Does it mean curse them? No, it means the exact opposite. It means their presence is bringing cursed things into your life because, again, they're teaching things which are not true. So you don't associate with those people because they're going to drag you down. Because, well, certainly in my tradition anyways, there are a number of factors to forgiveness. You can be given forgiveness only if three qualifications are met. Number one, you say you're sorry. Number two, you mean that you're sorry. And number three, you work to rectify the situation. Unless those three things are done in unison, no, forgiveness even from on high, is not yours. And these people on your quote-unquote progressive side, one, they've never said that they're sorry about what they've done. Two, even if they did say they're sorry, you can tell by their actions that they don't really mean it. All they've done is one small part of the third by saying, look, here's a movie that actually meets all the requirements that you've been saying. Isn't that enough? Come and join us once again. No, again, no, you've been lying to us for decades, purposefully subverting the entire process to use everything good that we can produce against us in order to bring in your ideology as an idea that is accepted through the literal declaration as a Trojan horse. There is no forgiveness here. There is no, let's just go back to the way things are here. Because why? Because their intent and the context matters. It's not the 1990s anymore. We don't look at everything and say, well, everything's relative. Of course, we'll apply the same rules to them as we do to ourselves. Well, yeah, we'll apply those rules, but we have to look at the context and the intent of what those rules mean and the people that they are applied to. Their intent, again, is to subvert the entire thing. If you believe that they've turned over a new leaf with one movie, even two movies, even a dozen movies, even a decade worth of movies, you have to look at the fact that they've been spending, at the bare minimum, three decades doing the exact opposite and lying to you. And again, you want forgiveness? Sure, I'll give you forgiveness. If you meet those three criteria, prove to me you've met those three criteria, and then I'll give you a forgiveness. But that still doesn't mean I trust you. It's not forgive and forget. It's forgive and remember. It's to say, well, I know your past. I know your problems in the past. I know you've lied to me over and over again at the past. I've forgiven you for that, if you met those three criteria. But I'm not going to place you anymore in a position where you're tempted to do that again. That's part of the rectification, by the way. It's, I need to extract myself from the situations wherein I was caused to do these wrong things. You don't extract yourselves from that? Sorry, you don't meet that third criteria of forgiveness. And so this is why I said in my last video, will Hollywood ever be able to recover? And my answer was maybe, 
maybe if you give us the exact thing we want for decades and decades, and that's still, that's still a maybe. And while I freely admit that I get passionate about these kinds of arguments, as I am right now, that doesn't mean my entire thing is based upon feeling. It doesn't mean that what I'm presenting to you is irrational. What I'm presenting to you over the last, well, probably 40 minutes of this video is based in rationality, is based in logic, is based in reality. That's the context. And if you have people who are hell-bent on subverting that, if their intent is to subvert reality, logic, reason, in order to sell you a narrative through a Trojan horse of story, and they've proven that that's what they've been doing for decades and decades, no, one movie is not going to make me trust them. So, if I've given you anything new to think about, hit like, hit the shield in the lower right-hand corner of your screen to subscribe, and leave me a comment. Tell me what you think about all this. And don't forget, there are two links in the description and the pinned comment for my three graphic novels. Graphic novels that center around the idea of the traditional virtue-based hero with merit to construct the story and the art. And if any of that sounds or looks appealing to you at all, click on one of those links in the description to go on over and see if one of my graphic novels is for you. And also, after I'm done speaking, I will be playing the minute and 45 second trailer to one of my graphic novels just to give you a little more idea of what it's about if you want to continue to watch and see what my graphic novels are like. All right, I'll leave it there. I'll see you later. Bye. An age ago, the beating heart of our people was a king who knew only victory. He wanted nothing more than an honorable death on the battlefield. Yet, none could match him. And so he wandered the earth, becoming lost in time and tide. Then we too lost our honest purpose, while silk-clad men sat upon the throne. But tremble now. All cities that lay under the stars for out of the shadows and mists of the land of promise, our courage has been rekindled, our heart has returned, and the world will burn.